Hello, this is Alan Elliott, and this is SAS Essentials, Mastering SAS for Data Analytics, 3rd Edition. This is Chapter 13, Correlation and Regression. In this chapter, we're going to be looking at procedures to calculate Pearson and Spearman correlations, uh, procedures to produce a matrix of scatter plots, also to perform a simple linear regression and a multiple linear regression, and procedures to calculate predictions using a model, as well as using SAS procedures to perform residual analysis. As usual, if you'd like to follow along with examples, please download the files at this web location. Let's get started. All right, let's look at section 13.1, correlation analysis using PROC CORE, C-O-R-R. -R. This is correlation analysis basics. So the correlation coefficient is a measure of the linear relationship between two quantitative variables measured on the same entity. So the correlation rho is a unitless quantity ranging from negative one to one, where rho equal negative one and rho equal positive one correspond to perfect negative and positive linear relationships, respectively. And rho equals zero indicates no linear relationship. In practice, it's often of interest to test these hypotheses. First, the null hypothesis that rho equals zero, that is, there is no linear relationship between the two variables. Or, the alternative, rho not equal to zero, there is a linear relationship between the two variables. So let's look at using SAS PROC CORE for correlation analysis. So the correlation coefficient rho is typically estimated from data using the Pearson correlation coefficient, usually denoted with an R. PROC CORE in SAS provides a test of the above hypothesis designed to determine whether the estimated correlation coefficient R is significantly different from zero. And the syntax for this is as follows. So it's similar to other syntaxes we've seen for other procedures, but PROC CORE, and then OPTIONS, and then SEMICOLON, and then after that, some other statements, again, optional. So some common options for PROC CORE, and we've seen a lot of these in other procedures. One would be the data equal, we've seen that. But the one we haven't seen is the Spearman option, which requests the Spearman rank correlations be uh, displayed. No simple suppresses the display of descriptive statistics. No prob suppresses the display of p-values. Plots equal, which we'll look at in a minute, for instance plots equal matrix, requests a scatter plot matrix, and plots equal scatter request individual scatter plots. And then out p equal specifies an output data set, data set containing Pearson correlations. And then in the optional statements for PROC CORE, uh, these are some of the things that we could use, we, we could, uh, use in, that, uh, in the uh, statement. And again, many of them are common to other PROCs, but the VAR statement, which we've seen before, the WITH statement, uh, ask for all possible correlations uh, between the VAR list and the variable in the WITH uh, list. And we'll see an example of that. The model statement specifies dependent and independent variables for the analysis. For instance, the statement model and then dependent variable equal one or more independent variables. And again, we'll see that in an upcoming example. And then the by format label and where, which we've seen in other uh, common statements. All right, so let's start off with an example 13.1. Open up the program file acore1.sas and we see this code, a simple program where we have PROC CORE, and we're using the data called SUM data that's on our hard drive. And we're asking for uh, correlations between the variables age, time one, and time two, and then a title and run. Now, when we, when we uh, submit this program or run it, uh, we see the table that we get below here. And notice that uh, in each cell, the top number is the correlation in each box, as you see. And the bottom is the p-value testing the hypothesis. So if we look at age and the uh, age and time one, for instance, we see the correlation is 0.0088. 
and the p-value is 0 0.0002. So what that tells us is that the correlation, the estimated correlation is 0.5, and that the uh, that we reject the null hypothesis that it's zero. It's sufficiently different from zero uh, to say that uh, this is a, an actual uh, uh, correlation. And then you can look at it for the other ones. Now, you might also notice that this is a, like a mirror image of each other. So we can look at age by time one or time one by age and you get the same answer. And then on the on the diagonal, obviously the correlation between each variable age by age, time one by time one, is always going to be just one. Let's look at another example, 13.2. Uh, so open up the program file acore2.sass, and again we see this code. And the difference in this code is we've added the statement plots equal matrix. Now notice that this is in the uh, options area, proc core, before the semicolon. So we have the data option and then we have plots equal matrix. The rest of it is pretty much the same as what we saw in the previous example. So let's see what this does. All right, what, what we've asked for by plots equal matrix is a plot of a matrix of the data. So again, uh, we can look at uh, age by time one, and there is the uh, plot of the uh, observations, age, age by time one, the second uh, cell uh, at the very top, or the middle cell, and then uh, age by time two would be the third cell in the top group and so forth. And, and, it, and visually we can see that probably the best uh, correlation would be time one by time two. Uh, look at that and you can see that the uh, scatter plot the, of uh, observations is a much tighter uh, scatter around uh, what we would think of as a linear uh, correlation there. And that's not surprising because that one had the highest correlation that we could, we could see. Let me back up just a second and we see that that correlation was 0.76. So that was the highest one uh, we saw in the group. And so naturally that would be the one visually that would look uh, like it had the best correlation. We can also change uh, the option to plots equal matrix and then in parentheses histogram. And what it'll do is now include a histogram uh, in the uh, diagonals. Now this is a histogram of whatever variable uh, is listed at the very top. So the first histogram is, is the histogram of age, and then time one and time two. Now, where this comes in handy, if we're maybe concerned about the uh, the normality of uh, the data, or maybe we're interested in seeing if there are some outliers or something. For instance, look in age one by uh, time one, and we see this lone uh, dot over at the bottom left. And then uh, if we look at the histogram of time one, we see that uh, that lone dot is represented by a very small uh, uh, bar on the histogram, whereas most of the data are uh, to the right. So uh, visually, both ways, we can see that maybe the uh, uh, data in time one is a little bit skewed to the right. All right, now let's take another look at an example. Here's 13.3. Uh, and in this case, open up the program file called acore3. We're just going through some of the options here to see how they work. So again, this is very similar to what we've been, we've been looking at, but we're adding on a new statement here. Notice uh, proc core and then the var statement, time one through time four, different variables, but, and then we say with age. And so what that gives us is the box we see down below where we have age by time one, age by time two, age by time. So you can see this is a little bit different than uh, the sort of the matrix of correlations we got earlier. This one uh, is specifying uh, a single row, age by whatever variables we're looking at. So again, uh, that's another way to, to display uh, whatever correlations you're interested in. And again, the correlation value or uh, coefficient is on the top, 0.5, whereas the probability uh, uh, for testing the hypothesis is on the bottom. So for instance, for time one, again, it's 0.5 and then the p-value 0.0002. So that was correlation, which we can obviously do it with several different ways, but it's a fairly simple thing to do. But now let's move on to simple linear core, uh, regression. So simple linear regression is used to predict the value of a dependent variable from the value of an independent variable. Uh, so the following code would uh, do that. So we have procreg, 
And then we have a model statement. We haven't seen this before. We haven't seen this before, but model fvc, which is a is a variable, and that is going to be our dependent variable, the one on the left. And then asb, whatever that is, is going to be an independent variable. So we want to see if we can predict fvc from asb, and that's uh, so how this model statement works. We'll see that in some examples here. So to simplify that, it's model and then dependent variable on the left equals independent variable on the right. So the statement syntax indicates the dependent variable, which is we're calling here dependent VAR, uh, as the measure you're trying to predict. And the independent variable on the right, or the we're calling independent VAR, is our predictor. So what does that mean? So let's look at the uh, what a regression line looks like. So a regression line is an estimate of a theoretical line describing the relationship between that independent variable x, we're going to call it, and the dependent variable y. So here we have uh, an equation here where y is the independent variable, you see. y is equal to, and then we have alpha plus beta x uh, uh, plus uh, some error term. And the, the thing we're most interested in there is the, the x, that's what we're, the error independent variable. And then we're going to estimate b, which is going to give us, uh, we're going to actually estimate uh, alpha and uh, beta, and that's going to give us an equation so that we can predict y from x. So a, or alpha, uh, is the y-intercept, beta is the slope, and the little e there is an error term uh, that's a normally distributed with zero mean and constant variance. So beta equals zero, if, that, if we're going to test that, beta equals zero, and we find out that that's true, that indicates there's no linear relationship between x and y. A simple linear regression analysis is used to develop an equation for predicting the dependent variable given the value of x of the independent variable. So the regression line calculated by SAS is given as, and we call it y hat, that's the estimate of y, is equal to a plus bx, where a and b are the uh, least squares estimates of alpha and beta. So alpha and beta are the uh, theoretical values. Uh, a and B are the, are the uh, estimates that we're going to get from the actual numbers. All right, the tested hypothesis for a linear regression is as follows. So the null hypothesis states that there's no predictive linear relationship between the two variables uh, because beta equal zero indicates there's no linear relationship between X and Y. Then the null hypothesis of this relationship is tested using these hypotheses. Uh, so the null hypothesis is that beta equals zero, that is, there's no relationship, or the alternative beta is not equal to zero, uh, which means there is a relationship. And of course, we use a low p value, say p less than 0.05, to indicate significant evidence to conclude that the slope of the line is not zero. That is, some knowledge of x would be useful in predicting y. And just a tangent here, but the t-test for the slope uh, is mathematically the same as the t-test of the correlation null hypothesis of rho equals zero that we saw earlier in the correlational example. All right, so the general syntax for PROC reg is as follows. So we have PROC reg and then some options, semicolon, and then some statements. So here we have uh, the normal statement uh, data equal data name, we know that one. Now we have this option, simple, which displays simple statistics, core, which includes a display uh, of a correlation matrix for the variables listed in the model and bar statements. The plots option, we'll see, if we have plots equal none, it suppresses the graph. Otherwise, it's going to give us some diagnostic graphs. No print suppresses the output, and that we would use that when we want to capture the results, maybe, but not display them. And then finally, alpha equal p sets the significant levels for confidence and prediction intervals, typically uh, automatically set at 0.05. And then some statements uh, for PROC reg uh, is the model statement. We've already taken a look at that, but model dependent variable equal independent variable and then slash some possible options. Uh, output out equal uh, gives, uh, so it creates an output data set. And here's an example over the right where you have model uh, y equal a1, b1. And then we're going to output to uh, a file called outreg where we're going to, out uh, to uh, output a y hat which is the prediction of y, uh, and then y residual. And that creates uh, the variables y hat for predicted values p 
and y resid for residual values. There's some other handy variables we could look at here, like uh, confidence limits. So we'll uh, look at that later. And then the plots equal option uh, requests uh, various plots, and we can see what those look like, and we're going to look at that some of those uh, as we go along. And then finally, the common options by format, label, and where. All right, just to uh, reinforce the SAS model statement, uh, we have on the left, we have dependent variable, and I have variables here because uh, in the long run, we could uh, have multiple ones, but we have, we're not going to really talk about that. And then equal independent variables, uh, one or more independent variables on the right-hand side of the predictor equation. So again, you just sort of need to know uh, and, and rely on this model statement uh, to uh, come up with what you're trying to uh, predict and what is the predictor variable. So on the right, the independent variables also predict doors. And on the left, that's what we're trying to predict, the dependent variable. All right, so let's look at a sample of uh, uh, regression. So open up the program file areg1.sas and we've entered some data here and so I don't have that data in uh, that code here but then we go on to proc reg and we have the required model statement. So in this case uh, the variables in the data we entered are task and create and what we're trying to do is see if we can uh, predict the value of task from some observation of create. Now these were uh, variables that are, are, that are uh, observed on the same individual. So task and create were, were observed on the same individual. Now if we know uh, the create uh, value for an individual, can we predict the task uh, value? And that's what we're asking here in this model statement. All right, so when we run that, the first thing we want to look at is the R square, which is a me measure of the strength of association. So this is not R. But if you take R and square it, you get R squared. And so that, that's, again, what this value is. It goes from 0 to 1. So if it's close to 1, that's a very high uh, strength of association. Close to 0 is a low strength of association. So 0.3 is not that great of an a, a association. Nevertheless, we have the regression equation at the bottom. And uh, if you remember, when we looked at the uh, regression equation, uh, it was of this kind. So the task, which we're trying to, to measure, is going to be 2.16. That's the intercept. And we looked at that. That was alpha in our original uh, uh, statement, our equation, plus 0.0625 times create. So those two values called parameter estimates. You plug those into this equation here, and uh, now we get a predictive equation. So if I know the value of create, I can predict the value of task. Now, of course, the question is how good of a uh, predictor is this equation? It is a, it is a predictor, but uh, the R square in some ways predicts how good of a predictor that is. So let's look, take a look at a graphical result of this. <clears throat> so as you can see on the left, we have task on the uh, vertical axis, and on the bottom we have create. And then the, z, the little uh, uh, zeros are the actual uh, data that we have observed. And you notice they sort of follow along a, uh, a line. In fact, it, it uh, creates that solid line, is the line that it uh, has created as the uh, linear uh, uh, predictor line. And so we can see it sort of goes through the, uh, the scatter of plots, but they're not that tight together. And remember, the uh, R square was 0.3, and that told us that this, uh, this scatter along the line was not really uh, great, but uh, it, it, there is some uh, prediction value here. The shaded error area represents a 95% confidence interval for the average task score for a create score. So if we have a create score of 60, for instance, we can go up there uh, in, in the, to the line, and we see that we would predict about a 5.8 or something like that. And then this 95% uh, confidence interval g uh, gives us some uh, uh, range or some idea of how good an estimate that might be. Then we have some diagnostic plots for the linear regression. And again, this is given to you without asking. You can say no plots and, and uh, uh, not get these. But uh, these are often helpful uh, in order to uh, try to determine if this is a good fit or not. The first one is the residual. 
uh, plot at the upper uh, left. And uh, it pr plots residual by predictive value. And what we want to see is a random scatter of points above and below the zero line, uh, which is the case here, which means uh, that this is uh, you know, not too far off uh, in, in terms of uh, how the residuals look. But a non-random non pattern of dots could indicate an inadequate model. So we want to see a random scatter. If it's uh, very skewed in one way, then maybe that's not a good uh, model. Then the next one we look, look at is the R student by predicted value plot. And this indicates whether any studentized residuals fall below two standard deviations, which would indicate an unusual value. In this case, none of them fall beyond the plus two a plus minus two limit. So again, you see the little lines at the top and bottom, and all of the dots fall within uh, two standard deviations. So that's, uh, that is a good th site. Then we have our student by leverage plot, which attempts to locate the observation that might have unusual influence or leverage on the calculation of the, reg of the regression coefficients. In this case, there is a possible one observation that has an undue influence. Uh, you notice the most of the uh, data are over there on the left, but you have this one lone point over here on the right. And you might wonder, what is that uh, observation? Why, what makes it different? And uh, if, because it's different, is it causing some sort of a influence that uh, maybe it shouldn't have on the rest of the model? All right, so let's look at the next one, which is the residual by quartile plot. Uh, in this case, a tight and random scatter along the diagonal indicates an adequate fit to the model, and that's exactly what we have here, although there is some sort of a pattern going on here. But we do have uh, the dots are uh, a tight fit along the diagonal. We like to see that. And then we have uh, this next one is the dependent variable task by predictive value, which vi uh, visualizes the variability in the prediction. So if there's a pattern, uh, that is uh, some variability increases as the predicted value increases, for instance, it indicates a non-constant variance in, uh, of the error. Now, we don't really see that here, but uh, for instance, if it was tight at one point and then it spread out, then we may have an issue with variance. Uh, the Cook's D plot uh, is designed to identify outliers or leverage points. In this case, it appears that observations 5 and 6 are suspect. Now, right above it, where we looked at the leverage point, we saw that that one point up there was a little unusual. It's probably uh, either five or six, probably six, because we see that uh, there's two points. Now, in this case, Cook's D, that, is, that it's saying uh, maybe these points uh, are, uh, are outliers and are not following the pattern of all the rest of the uh, observations. So we might want to keep them, keep a look at them and, and, and figure out what's going on. Finally, we have a residual by percent plot, which assesses the normality of the residuals. And again, we want to see something that fits uh, the normal curve. It's not too bad there, although it doesn't have a bunch of tails on either side. And uh, the proportion uh, less uh, uh, spread plot uh, plots the proportion of the data by the rank for two or more categories. So if the vertical spread based on the rank data is about the same, it means that there's about the same variance in both the fitted and residual values. So what we want to have that, we want to those to look fairly uh, similar. We notice that the fit mean uh, is a little bit more scrunched up than the residual, uh, but maybe not too bad there. All right, now that we have a model that we think is uh, adequate, uh, we could use that model then to predict new values. So for this model, we might conclude that there is a moderate linear fit between create and task, but it's not impressive. R square is 0 0.0375 as we saw. Which, re which relates to about 31, it describes about 31% of the variation uh, is accounted for by the regression using CREATE. So using the information in the regression equation, uh, you could predict the value of task from CREATE equal 40. So if we think a, uh, if some new student comes in, for instance, and gets a value of 40, we might want to uh, then predict what their task score uh, might be. And in this case, uh, we plug it into the equation and we see that we would predict a task score of, point of uh, 4.67 using the uh, uh, equation that we've created. So again, uh, once we have a create, uh, an equation, we can plug in numbers on the right-hand side 
which are observed, and to predict the numbers on the left-hand side, uh, which are predicted uh, values there. All right, so that was a simple linear regression, but what if we have more than one predictor? And in that case, it becomes multiple linear regression. And again, we're still using PROC REG. So multiple linear regression is an extension of simple linear regression. Uh, and in this case, there's a single still a single dependent variable y, but there's more than one independent variable x. And as with simple linear regression, the multiple regression equation is calculated by, by SAS uh, in a sample-based version of the theoretical equation describing the relationship. And again, I won't go into it in detail, but basically y uh, in this equation is, our, is what we're trying to predict. Uh, alpha, again, is the intercept, and then we have uh, uh, betas for each one of the x's. So if we have, uh, the x's are the predictors, and so we're, gonna, we're going to then estimate a beta value for each one. We plug those values into this equation uh, and then we can get a prediction equation. All right, so as a part of the analysis, the statistical significance of each of the coefficients is tested using a student's t-test to determine uh, if it contributes significantly. So in this case, the null hypothesis, and there's only multiple ones of these, uh, the null hypothesis for the first predictor, uh, beta one, for instance, is, is equal, and the null is beta one does not equal zero, and then there's one uh, a similar hypothesis, beta 2 equals 0, beta not, uh, 2 not equals 0. So each one of these tests, we would uh, then uh, use some low value, and we'll in this case uh, just stick with 0.05, to conclude whether or not each one of the predictive variables is an important predictor uh, in the equation that we're uh, developing. All right, so as we mentioned, uh, just as a refresher, here we have PROC reg, we have options, and we have statements, so let's start filling in this information. Uh, again, the options that we see, uh, uh, an option P, request the table creating predictive values, R, request that residuals be analyzed, CLM, uh, predicts or, or prints out the 95% confidence limits, upper and lower limits, CLI, request upper and lower confidence limits for the individual values, include equals some number, is include the first K variables in the variable list, as we're going to see later, we're going to look at how to select variables. Uh, selection options, we're going to look at these, but there's backwards, forwards, stepwise, and so on. Uh, SL stay specifies the maximum p-value for a variable to stay in a model during this automated selection procedure. And then entry uh, is, again, a minimum p-value to enter the model uh, for the uh, automated procedure, in this case, the stepwise selection. All right, so let's look at an example, uh, 13.5. Open the program file named areg2.sas, and you'll see this code. And again, there's some data that's been previously entered. But we're going to uh, uh, now do a proc reg. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to predict a job score. We give it, we've given some uh, 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 of our employees uh, four different tests. And each of these tests, we're thinking, might be good predictors of how well they'll do the job. So the idea might be if we can come up with some easy tests to give employees to see how well they do their job, then we might be able to give these same tests to applicants and predict how well a job they would do if they were hired. So that might be the motivation for creating this kind of analysis. So in this case, uh, uh, we have four different tests and can it predict a job score? And the, the other question is, are all four needed, or can we get by with just taking two of these tests? Maybe they cost $10 each or $20 each. Can we just do a couple of the tests instead of all four and save some money? All right, when we run this uh, initial analysis, we're going to get an R-square, in this case, of 0.97. Now, remember the last time we did it, we got 0.3 something. So this is a much better predictor uh, equation than our previous uh, predictor equation. And so that's why I want to look at R-square. The closer it is to 1, the better uh, the strength of the prediction is. Uh, so again, we have parameter estimates, and this is sort of an expanded version of what we saw for the simple linear regression. Again, we have intercept, in this case, 0.95, or negative 0.95559939. And then we have uh, values, or slopes, basically, for each of the four variables, uh, where test one's value is 0.17, and so forth. And we can use this information under the parameter estimate column 
to create uh, the prediction equation, as we're going to see here in just a minute. All right, so uh, we again get diagnostics, uh, which are the same as what we've seen earlier. So I'm not going to go through all of this example, but you might look in the text for some further explanation about uh, what's going on here. Uh, maybe some of them are more interesting than uh, just uh, nothing going on. So take a look at the text and it'll talk about some of these uh, values here. All right, so the typical goal of the multiple linear regression is to arrive at a model that gives you an optimal regression equation with the fewest parameters. Again, uh, usually uh, getting information uh, costs money for each uh, observation, whether it's uh, uh, in a medical situation or uh, in, this, in this case, a job situation or any kind of thing, in a survey situation where you're going out and gathering information uh, from people or machines or whatever it is, each piece of information costs money. And so you want to uh, hopefully come up with an equation with the fewest parameters as possible that does the good job. So uh, can we choose or select variables uh, using some sort of manual or automated method uh, to come up with these with the, with the good uh, predictor? So the various model selection techniques don't always result in the same final model. Uh, and the decision concern, if they did, we'd just have the one, one way to do it, and that'd be enough. But no, there's several ways to do it because they, they oftentimes come up with slightly different uh, answers. So the decision concerning which variables to include in the final model uh, should not simply be based entirely on these automated procedures, but on the knowledge of the uh, researcher uh, who may say, wait a minute, this, this variable has to be in the model, uh, otherwise it just doesn't make sense, uh, even though maybe the model selection technique told, said it wouldn't be in there. And so the, knowledge, the researcher's knowledge uh, is valuable uh, in the selection process, as well as some sort of automated procedure. Now, we saw some of these uh, uh, options earlier, but let's talk about them in more detail. So the default values for SL stay, that is, uh, variables that are going to stay in the model uh, when we're using a backward, uh, or st uh, backward uh, uh, model selection and 0.15 for stepwise. So let me just briefly say, so backwards, uh, backward selection means you put all, of, uh, all, of all the variables in the model, and then one by one you start taking them away uh, using this SL stay criteria. And as long as they're uh, valuable in the predictor, then you uh, leave them in there. But if they're not valuable, then you take them off one by one until you've taken off all the ones that aren't valuable. For stepwise, uh, it's a little, it's, it's you start out with nothing, and then you start adding uh, variables. Uh, at, at the, you add the best variable, and then you say, is there any other variable that's, that's good? And you add that one. And at the same time, you look at the variables that have entered because they, they affect one another, and you say, whoops, maybe I entered several, but this one now is no longer needed, and so I, I get rid of it. So that's, well the, that's sort of a brief explanation of what's going on there. Uh, SL entry for forward uh, is 0.5 and 0.15 for stepwise again. So forward is sort of like what I'm just described for stepwise, except you never take any out. You just keep adding variables until there's no good variable to add. All right, and then there's some other explanation there that I won't go over, uh, but you can, again, look in the text uh, for uh, more detailed information. So let's look at a hands-on example, 13.6. Uh, open up the program file called areg3.sas, and uh, we created a data, data set called job, and this data set had uh, five variables in it. Job score is the uh, some score given to workers. Maybe uh, their manager gave them a score uh, rank them on how good they did the job. And then we gave them four tests. Uh, maybe they were text, tests of dexterity, whatever they were. And we wanted to, again, know, are these tests predictor, good predictors of the job score? So we have the model job score equal to four tests, and then slash selection equal backwards. So we're going to use the backward uh, criteria first. Again, remember what that is. That is, start with all the variables and then begin taking them away until they're uh, the, only the ones remaining are the ones that we think are important. Now, when we run that program, we'll see that it took out uh, test two and test four and left in test one and test three. So it determined that the only uh, two variables that we really needed was test one and test two. And uh, so we, now we see that we could create an equation here using the intercept and the two values under the parameter estimates. 
Now, so let's change this model selection criteria by changing the SL stay option to 0.05. So if you specify SL stay equal 0.05, which is a, which is a more uh, rigorous uh, way to, uh, uh, to look at the model, then, and we run it, then the only one that le is left is test three. So we can see now that uh, depending on SL, what SL stay is set at, whether you use the default or set it at some value, we may get a slightly different answer. So in this case, we only have step three. Uh, I would encourage you to try forward and stepwise selection uh, to see uh, what difference they make in the various selection procedures. And again, follow along the examples in the text. Now, again, sort of like what we did with a, a simple linear regression, once we come up with a final model, uh, and in this case, we're going to decide that the final model we're going to use is just the one with test three in it, uh, then we want to predict values uh, from, for new subjects or new uh, maybe applicants for this job using this model. So in the job score example, we could use the model given by uh, table 13.10 in the book to predict how well the new prospect will do the job. So here we see job score equal neg negative 76.81 plus 1.71651. Now where did those numbers come from? They came from the parameter ex estimates. There's the intercept and uh, the slope. So we, we use those values to create this prediction equation. And in this case, we're, we're, we're reverting back really to a, a, a simple linear regression here, but nevertheless, uh, this is what our prediction equation has given us. So using this prediction equation, we can calculate job score for new applicants. And we could do that by hand, or we could do that uh, in SAS. So maybe we have a thousand new job applicants. We want to do, want, don't want to do that by hand. And so we're going to look at a technique where we might be able to do that. So we're going to create a new data set containing new values for the independent variables, that is, new applicants. We're going to merge uh, the two data sets, append them, and calculate the regression equation and the regression predictions, and then use the ID option to display new values in the output. All right, so here we're going to create a new data set called new apps. These are uh, applications, uh, applic applicants for the new jobs. And we're in, inputting the subject name or ID number 101, 102, etc. And uh, we gave them a test, test three. And here's the value for the test. Uh, uh, subject 101 got a 79, subject 110 got an 87. And so we have uh, new values for the test three. Now, this is not the old values that we used to predict uh, the equation, but these are brand new values. So uh, we're going to create another data set called report where we're going to combine the old data set, which was called job, and the new data set called new apps. We're using the set statement, set, job, new apps. That basically appends new apps onto the bottom of jobs. We're also going to create a, a new variable called predict ID. And we've seen this before, but this is a concatenation uh, uh, function. And again, you can look at that. I think it's in, uh, well, it's in one of the appendices in the back of the book. Uh, where we're going to take the uh, subject, a semicolon, and then uh, the value of test three. That's going to be our new uh, ID for this uh, subject. Uh, so, and then, now that we have a new uh, data set called report, we're going to use that report in the PROC reg, data report. Uh, we're going to use the ID, predict ID. And then, again, we have the model statement, job score equal test three. And we're going to, we're going to ask for two items, P, and CLI. We defined those earlier, but uh, predictive and a confidence limit. All right, so this is what we get. As you can see, the top part of our output is the old data, uh, where we have uh, uh, the, the values of both uh, uh, the, the uh, of test three uh, and the original score. Uh, and on the bottom, we have uh, the new applicants, 101, 102, 103, and we created this unique ID, 101 colon 79, 102 colon 78. That was the score that they got. We can see at the top, a uh, similar kind of thing, person number one got a 90 score, person number two got an 88 score, etc. All right, so now we have the predicted values. Now, it predicted the values uh, for the uh, upper part of the table, but we're not as quite as interested in those as we are in the predicted values for the new applicants. And that is the one with the, the uh, oval toward the bottom. 
So we see that uh, the predicted score, uh, job score for applicant 101 is a 58.79, uh, whereas uh, applicant 104 uh, has, a, has a value of 94.83. So we might be able to use this information uh, to say, uh, you know, if, if a larger predicted value for job score is good, then we could rank these uh, applicants uh, in the order of their uh, possibly predictive uh, value to us as new employees. So that's where something like this would come in handy. All right, so let's look at then some of re residual analysis. And residual analysis uh, is a way to, uh, again, evaluate uh, how well our uh, predictive equation is. So in the case of simple linear regression, scatter plots, uh, like the scatter plot matrix we showed earlier, are useful graphs for visually inspecting the nature of an association. And so the following uh, example is going to provide us uh, residual analysis techniques for assessing the appropriateness of a linear regression fit of a data set <coughs> for a multiple linear regression. All right, so let's take a look at this example. Open up the file called AREG5. And again, we're going to use this job uh, data set we've already uh, created before. And uh, in this case, we're going to do PROC REG on the data job. And this, in this case, model job score equal test 3. That's the one we've been using, but slash R. Now, the slash R requests an a residual analysis. And this is what we get from that residual analysis. A busy uh, uh, output, but let me try to explain it here. Uh, first of all, let's look at the column called student residual. And this com column contains Z scores for the residuals that provides a measure of the magnitude of the difference. Uh, so something greater than two or less than two is a si statistically significant uh, residual and may need further investigation. So here we have a predicted value how close is it to the actual value? So in the first uh, item, we see the original value was 78. We predicted 77.67. That's pretty close. So the residual va value would expect it to be close to zero, which it is. So that one is okay. But if, as we go down the list, we can see that, uh, that some of the uh, student residuals are fairly large. In, fa in fact, in uh, the case of observation 10, uh, we had get a negative 2.04, which means that that predicted value uh, was uh, diff much different than what we would have expected. And therefore, we might want to look at observation 10 to see if maybe it was miscoded or maybe something else was going on there. Also, we look at the Cook's D statistics, which gives an in indication of the influence of a particular data point. A uh, value close to zero indicates no influence, and a higher value, the greater the influence. So again, now we look at those and notice that uh, I, uh, uh, person seven or uh, observation seven uh, had the highest Cook's D. Again, what we might want to uh, examine there is uh, what, what's going on with this uh, value here. Again, maybe it's a miscoding, maybe something went wrong during the test. Uh, and again, we might want to use this to analyze uh, our data set and determine one, if something was wrong with how it was collected maybe an error in the recording of the data, or simply that uh, maybe this individual was uh, uh, much different than uh, maybe we were, would predict. And so it could be any of those things. Nevertheless, uh, this residual analysis gives us a handle on trying to uh, figure out what values might be different. Another way to look at it is a little, uh, if you look at the little stars on the second to the last column where it goes from negative two to two, yeah, this is giving us the same information as student residual. You can see the four stars at the bottom indicates a very large departure from uh, from uh, from zero, uh, and then the two stars on uh, subject seven again shows a little bit of a departure uh, that we might want to be uh, concerned about. All right, so that is the uh, uh, conclusion of this chapter on how to measure the association between two quantitative variables using correlational analysis or or uh, uh, linear regression. Uh, we're going to continue on to chapter 14, the analysis of variance. And uh, hopefully, uh, if this was helpful to you, please subscribe and click on the like button. And we'll see you next time.